Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sharon McCauley, and welcome to today's edition of Magazines Canada Ad Webinars. The topic today is Magazine Media Brands in the Digital Age, featuring four industry experts, Haley Overland of Chatelaine, Dan Robinson of Newcom, Sue Hawes, Cottage Life, and Greg Trott, Blue, Blue Ant Media. Over the course of this one-hour webinar, we'll look at how Canadian magazine media brands are adapting to the ever-evolving digital landscape. Our panelists, representing both consumer and B2B brands, will present case studies showcasing integrated content across multiple platforms, including print, online, video, social media, and broadcast. You'll learn practical advice and strategies for working with agencies and advertisers, and do's and don'ts based on some hard-earned experience. Before I introduce our speakers, a little more about me, your moderator for the webinar. For the past four years, I've been a publishing and marketing consultant specializing in print and digital magazine strategy, including content marketing and audience development. Over my career, I've held the role of publisher and group publisher for a number of consumer and B2B brands including Toronto Life, Quill & Quire, Investment Executive, Ottawa Magazine, and Wear Canada. It's my pleasure to welcome our talented panelists today uh, in order of their appearance. First up, we have Haley Overland, Senior Editor, Social Media at Chatelaine, and formerly of today's parent. Uh, Haley will be followed by Dan Robinson, the Director of Digital Marketing at Newcom Business Media, Newcom is one of Canada's premier B2B publishers specializing in providing information and marketing services to a wide variety of industries through magazines, directories, and trade shows. Finally, Sue Haas will walk us through an integrated brand content campaign created by Cottage Life, where she's the director of digital media operations, and she'll be joined by her colleague, Greg Trout, who's the director of broadcast solutions for Blue Man Media. <laughs> You'll no doubt have questions for our panelists, and we'll be presenting you with two opportunities. Uh, there will be a few minutes for questions after each individual presentation, and then more time for a Q&A after all three presentations um, have been delivered. So if questions come to mind as a, as a presenter is speaking, please type them into the chat box that appears on your screen. After the individual presentation, I'll read your questions aloud, and the presenter will answer them. Uh, and then we'll subsequently open up for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and now, over to Haley. Hi, everyone. Um, earlier this year, in uh, what was really December, December 3rd, 2015, last year, um, we introduced a brand new Chatelaine. And um, sort of in keeping with this, uh, the topic today, um, we were introducing a Chatelaine for the digital age. Um, the magazine is almost 100 years old, 90 years, 91 years old, and uh, so and it's primarily known as a, a print magazine. And our demographic isn't millennial. Our demographic is 35 to 45, with all the focus on millennial. Um, we needed to really drive home that our audience is special, and our audience is 35 to 45. Um, I guess I just pressed this. Um, so we did a massive survey of 1,000 Canadian women um, asking them nosy questions about love, work, and life. Uh, and we presented that information in our January 2016 magazine. And uh, we used it as a way to introduce ourselves as a digital brand, as a brand of, like, of 2016 that was social media savvy and digitally savvy. Um, and we, again, wanted to make sure that people knew who we were, who we are now, and who our audience is. So um, we started, this is 40ish, we introduced this survey, um, and we did it both in the magazine and um, online by doing a day-long, um, sort of like a, a Twitter Facebook party, um, where we introduced all the information um, that we gleaned from our 1,000 participants um, uh, through various um, modes of social media, and uh, and so you'll see. I'll show you a little bit about that. We we all basically all the editors sat in a room, and uh, we made things happen. So here's us sitting in a room. Uh, this was all day from nine to past five o'clock. 
Um, we used uh, tools like Chartbeat and Dive and Twitter and Facebook feeds um, to really gauge as we went along um, sharing the information um, well, how the audience online was responding so we could get immediate reactions how our content was doing. Um, and here you can see. Okay, so basically we presented um, information on Twitter. Um, for example, um, some of the questions included like how many women, how many of these women consider themselves feminist? And a shocking number, 68% considered themselves feminist. And we played video and we shared the poll results um, through various, through Twitter and Facebook. And as a result, all day sharing this information, we trended number one in Toronto and we had an organic reach on Facebook of over 500%. Um, the campaign on Twitter was um, acknowledged uh, by Justin Trudeau and Lena Dunham, both of whom tweeted us using our This Is 40-ish hashtag. This was a purely editorial initiative. Uh, there were no advertisers associated with it, but this is something that we could definitely see inviting sponsors or advertisers in on in the future. So basically, you can see a little bit more of what I'm talking about. Um, basically, with the results of the poll, um, we, we parceled it out into um, sort of digestible pieces on social media. So you can see here we made cards and we did Facebook video and uh, Twitter video as well. And this was going on throughout the day with the th This Is 40-ish hashtag and audience engaging with us from 9 to 5 on this uh, content um, polls showing uh, various, uh, for example, how often do you cook um, right there. Um, we, we used newly released features on Twitter and Facebook to share the content and to create um, new content. So as people were responding to the content, we were able to answer their questions um, uh, as we went with new content. For example, as you can see on the right, uh, I created a Facebook note with just a snippet of a Gloria Steinem article that we had that answered a lot of people's questions about the feminism, the results um, on our feminism poll. Um, we used uh, polls on Twitter as well uh, on Facebook, we were polling our audience every six minutes, and people are so afraid of frequency on Facebook, but the reach, as uh, I mentioned earlier, was beyond anything we'd seen before, especially not being a brand who's not known for being a social media or, or digital innovator. So we were really introducing ourselves and announcing ourselves as uh, innovators in this on, on digital. So um, industry influentials really helped us out. Um, we had BuzzFeed Canada noticing us, Huffington Post Canada, Kirsten Stewart from Twitter Canada, and you guys in Canadian Magazine. Um, or sorry, no, that's not you guys, that's Canadian Magazine. Um, and so the other social influentials included um, Katie Telford and Julie S. Lalonde. And, uh, and others as well. So it helps, the influencers are a huge deal for us. If we don't have advertisers, we had to really rely on our influencers to help us get the word out. Um, here is uh, Justin Trudeau and Lena Dunham's tweet. Here's Lena Dunham, obviously. Uh, we presented her with the, the one of the questions was, um, can two Canadian women, to our, the women we surveyed, um, do you, how do you feel um, looking at yourself naked? And we asked Lena Dunham um, about what she thought about how 73% of these women didn't like the way they looked naked, and she obviously had something to say about it. And that was pretty awesome, uh, as you can see. And Justin Trudeau used our hashtag and our Twitter handle, and that was, his tweet was retweeted and liked um, thousands of times. It was pretty awesome and really, really established us as like a Canadian, Canada's women's brand, uh, digital brand, social media innovator. 
So we had readers also remarking on uh, the success of this campaign and how interesting it was. Um, and it was pretty funny at the same time. We, you got to have some fun when you're doing like serious subject matter. Um, so that's a big thing on social media to show your personality and to be as transparent as possible. We are a brand, but we're, we're people and we want to be relatable. So this is what the survey looked like in print. Um, it was very successful in print and on iPad or digital editions as well. People were really curious about um, how Canadian women feel, from 35 to 45, how they feel on these, about these topics. Um, and we basically took pieces of this and shared it um, all, all, all over social media. So basically the important things to take away, I suppose, were that we use social media in innovative ways to really make an impact in a day-long campaign. Uh, we used Facebook Mentions Live, which is basically the periscope of Facebook, um, and I highly recommend exploring that if you ever want to get um, a message out, because the reach is pretty astronomical. Um, and we used Twitter video. We used Facebook polls. Um, we used Periscope as well. We used Twitter polls. And the poll features on both of those platforms were um, obviously really appropriate, because this these were polls that we were sharing. So we were able to ask our audience questions that we had asked our, our participants. So basically, um, also the main thing for, for me for social media and for our brand is relevant innovation uh, in terms of both content and social media tools, engagement, authenticity, relatability, and evolution. Because social media and the digital world is constantly changing. You just I don't know how many of you have seen the changes in Snapchat. They're almost every day. Um, so we have to constantly keep, uh, keep tabs on that. So thank you. I hope that was helpful and clear. Thanks, Haley. Uh, if anyone has questions for Haley, please feel free to uh, enter them into the chat box that we have on your screen. Um, Haley, I have a question for you related to um, uh, the conversations that you may have had with the publisher or the sales team about the potential for this. Yeah. Uh, was there an attempt to to try to package this in some way for, for sponsorship, or uh, was this really seen as a branding exercise uh, to to really plant the flag for Chatelaine as part of uh, part of your um, announcing your digital presence and um, trying to shake up the image that, that Chatelaine may have had. Yeah, it was really the latter. It was a purely editorial endeavor. Um, with, though, the, um, the we, we wanted to, to experiment so that we could see maybe in the future how something like this could work with, with sales and for advertising opportunities. So, because we had nothing really to show anyone uh, or to show potential sponsors or advertisers. So now we have something to show. We, we saw major success with this. Um, and that's what we, uh, moving forward, that's what we can, we can share and what we can do. Uh, that's great. And having done it once, then, do you think that this is something that the team will undertake again? I think it is. We have a couple of features coming up, pretty major features, actually. Um, so you can expect them around Mother's Day and then later in June, one after another. So you'll see us. Um, uh, talking about those a lot and presenting them in new and innovative ways. And uh, so we have not, I, I'm not sure about what the sponsorship situation is with those just yet, but we are doing similar things, um, things like this uh, all the time. Not a day long, however, these two will be smaller, smaller packages. Thanks very much, Haley. Uh, we'll now uh, turn this over to our second speaker, uh, Dan Robinson, Director of Digital Marketing at Newcom, to speak about his experience with multi-platform in the B2B world. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, this did not. Went ahead. Hmm? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, 
I started uh, at Newcom about five years ago, and Newcom being the a B2B and heavy, heavily involved in the, uh, or centered on the trucking industry, a lot of uh, the advertisers are, were a little bit slow to adopt uh, digital marketing other than, uh, you know, a lot of banner ads, but the vast majority of the revenue at Newcom at, uh, five years ago was definitely print advertising and uh, our events. We have the largest truck show in Canada as well, uh, and a retail magazine, much like uh, Auto Trader. Uh, uh, but that, uh, I came on board as a video specialist, uh, having worked in television for 20 years as a director. And uh, at another online company for four years, uh, where I got my start in doing online and, uh, editorial videos and marketing videos. Uh, so when I came to Newcom, I saw a real opportunity to uh, increase or introduce video to the trucking industry. I saw trucking test drives as a as a, a good a good editorial start, and we've had great success with that. We've done probably 15 trucking test drives over the last few years and we are, uh, our YouTube channel, Today's Trucking One, is now uh, approaching a thousand views a day uh, and we have 3,500 uh, subscribers and, you know, and that aids in driving traffic back to the website. Uh, so video is a, you know, is the reason I came to Newcom, but as a, when I arrived there and I started talking to customers, uh, you know, and, and especially sales reps who were hearing from their customers, they wanted to shift the percentage of their revenue out of print to digital. Uh, so in order to keep our share of the pie, we had to evolve and in increase the menu of uh, marketing products we were offering our, our advertisers. We, you know, much like a, an all-meat restaurant when 50% of the population becomes vegetarian, you either you have to start adding uh, the, expanding your menu or you're not going to last very long. So, and here's some, some statistics, uh, you know, 80% of marketers expect uh, to increase their digital spend uh, uh, over 2015, and 28% spend over 70% of their marketing budget on digital, uh, you know, and that's, that's a big increase over, over five years ago. Sorry about this, people. This is PowerPoint is not my forte. So uh, I just wanted to show you uh, how the revenue has changed over over a 10-year period. Where in, on the B2B side, 67% print advertising, uh, you know, 5% e-newsletter and and web. Ten years later, you know, it's, uh, it's probably about a 45% drop in. Uh, in print advertising, uh, from 67% to 46%, and uh, digital, uh, you know, is 20% uh, of revenue. Here's an interesting statistic: magazine uh, ad revenue, 2010 to 2015, compared to the behemoth that is is Facebook. So, a lot, you know, a lot of the money that uh, was once going into newspapers and magazines is now going to Google and Facebook. Uh, uh, combined, uh, Google and Facebook uh, have more ad revenue than all newspapers and magazines combined. So, <clears throat> but in that there's an opportunity because especially I feel in the, in the, the small to medium sized businesses uh, where they want to get into digital but they don't know how or, or what to, where to put their money and, uh, and they don't have the resources to have their own marketing department, they don't have the resources to hire a creative agency. And that's sort of where, where Newcom has focused is, is helping the small, our small to medium advertisers uh, by developing programs uh, in the digital area for them. Uh, as you can see here, 40% of marketers said the most significant barrier was not having the in, uh, skill set in-house to successfully develop a campaign, uh, and 35% cited a lack of an effective strategy. Uh, and of those that are successful, 
percent use a combination of uh, in-house and uh, outsourced resources. That's where the, uh, that's where you guys can come in. Uh, we had a an advertiser that was with in our, our dental magazine who for a number of years just did uh, print and uh, brochure inserts, polybag inserts. All they did was the, you know, uh, three or four full page print ads a year and polybag inserts and uh, the their, their spend with uh, oral health was, you know, uh, low five figures. Uh, the sales rep and I developed, went and had a brainstorming session with them, and we actually uh, came back to them with a plan that involved 12 different products. Uh, sorry about that typo in ad. I asked someone to fix that, but it never got fixed. <laughs> uh, so uh, they still did the print ad and the, and the brochure, uh, but we also uh, redesigned their brochures for them. They started doing banner ads uh, and e-blasts to target it because they, they're focused. They, they're a, a business development uh, uh, for our dentists, so they hold workshops uh, in Toronto and Montreal. So we would do e-blasts for them uh, targeted to the, the areas that, where they were holding workshops. Uh, we also redesigned their website, started an inbound marketing uh, campaign for them, uh, did website SEO. Uh, they had no social media or maybe a very weak Facebook page. We uh, developed uh, Twitter pages, YouTube, LinkedIn, and, and Facebook pages for them and are also doing uh, writing their, uh, so, you know, tweeting for them, doing Facebook ads for them. Uh, populating LinkedIn, uh, the videos on YouTube are videos that we've done for them with a mix of editorial videos, which I'll get to here. So we also do editorial videos on our oral health site. So we have uh, the, uh, Mark Lynn, who uh, owns uh, the company, the Tide company. Uh, he does workshops, and we had him come in to do editorial videos in our in our studio, and we put that up there. He doesn't; it's not anything to sell his product. It's it's to show him as an industry expert. So he'll talk about uh, different a lot of the questions that dentists call him or email him with. Uh, he will answer those in a short two-minute video. Uh, he we also let him you know we populate his website with um, his YouTube channel, but they're also on our. Uh, our website generating revenue through pre-roll advertising. We also did some promotional videos for his workshops. We developed a landing page for him with a lead gen form with the promo video and information about the courses and we would tweet out uh, the link to the landing pages. We also did some pre-roll advertising with him. We developed a 10 second pre-roll ad and with a companion banner ad and interesting statistic banner Banner ads, when paired with pre-roll advertising, are 18 times more likely to be clicked uh, clicked on. So it's a very effective, uh, uh, much more effective uh, advertising tool than uh, just banner ads. So, and and their ad spend with us went up tenfold from uh, from 2014 to 2015. So we we increased the the money they spent with us uh, by a factor of 10. And uh, the reason we were able to convince them was uh, because we had the expertise, we also were able to give them access to our subscribers, which are, is actually is the exact same uh, market that they want to reach. So we did all this stuff, but we also, the, the value add was that, you know, we're able to give them access to the people that they want taking their courses. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we did was uh, we developed Newcom Creative <laughs> shortly after I came on board uh, because there was a lot of in-house talent that we had. Uh, now that I was there with the video department, we were doing social media for our own magazines. We had an IT uh, web department that developed that did all our websites. 
And we had an art department that laid out our magazines, did all our house ads, and was already doing adver uh, ads for some of our uh, some of our advertisers. So we had a, an in-house team there, and it wasn't being leveraged uh, in to its full potential to generate revenue. It was viewed more as a cost center, uh, and now uh, all those all those departments are now generating revenue for for Newcom. Uh, so. By increasing uh, the amount of, uh, sorry, sorry about this. Uh, so this this allowed us to, with a lot of the companies that were looking to shift their money to digital, it allowed us to keep our share of the pie. And in a lot of cases, uh, our, the, the pie that we got, uh, the slice of the pie that we got was increased as money was being taken away uh, from the budgets of our competitors. Um, so that was, uh, you know, and the customer is very happy. Their workshops are full, and uh, and we have a great case study. It's probably the first customer we've had that we've sold that many different products to. Usually, it's, you know, if you have that the 12, 13, 14 products uh, on your menu, you might put a package together where uh, an advertiser might take four of them. Uh, but with them, we were able to, you know, present a case. Uh, that they agreed with that would be successful for to reach the goals that they had set for their for their marketing campaigns. Um, so I, I just want to being video is uh, you know something I'm very passionate about, and uh, so I want to talk about two ways that we monetize video at Newcom, and uh, mostly on the trucking side and and the dental side, but we do want to roll it out uh, to all of our different verticals that we're in. Uh, we are, our goal is to create one editorial video per week for each magazine uh, that we have. Uh, and with then we sell pre-roll advertising on the editorial videos. As I mentioned earlier, it comes with a companion banner ad directly above the video player. Uh, and if an advertiser doesn't have a pre-roll ad, we also sell them a uh, we'll make them a pre-roll ad for between $500 and $1,000. Uh, and what's great about pre-roll ads as a product is it's, it's very flexible and very inexpensive. If a company only has $500, they could buy pre-roll. You could put them into a pre-roll ad campaign uh, if they already have a video. If they don't, then they'd have to start at $1,000. But uh, so, uh, and it, it's, it's an easy sell to tack on, uh, you know, an extra $1,000 onto a, onto a $10,000 uh, campaign because it, it, they want to they test out the waters and it's uh, of, of pre-roll video advertising. And uh, it's been very effective and it generates good revenue for the company. Our videos uh, get watched. Uh, we have... Of all the videos we have in our magazines, we have uh, there's about 4,000 views a month, and it, you know, and we charge between a buck fifty and two dollars a play, depending on the market, and that's revenue that, uh, you know, even if a video is three years old, it's still generating revenue for you. Uh, we have a there's an article on one of the one of our websites that gets 10,000 views a month. It's a it's a topic that uh, is obviously uh, a lot of people are interested in, so we're going to be doing a video on that, and that's a good way to look for what types of videos to do, is look to see what stories on your website uh, are generating the most uh, views, uh, and make videos on that, because every time someone goes to that page, instead of making 10 cents on a banner or 5 cents on a banner, so maybe 25 cents a view, you're now quadrupling that, and you're making $2, $2.50, including the banner impressions. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that uh, I think is very effective. Another way that we make money is we do a video-only newsletter. So what we'll do is take the four videos that we do at that month and we'll send out a video uh, at the end of the, or a newsletter at the end of the month with links to all those four new videos that we have. Uh, and then we also 
allow our advertisers, if they have a product video, they can pay to have their product videos included in our video-only newsletter. So we're generating, we're generating revenue from uh, our advertisers placing their product videos, which are clearly marked as, that, as sponsored videos or advertiser videos, uh, on the newsletter. But we're also driving more traffic back to our website to watch the editorial videos that uh, have pre-play ads in front of them. So, so we get money from the newsletter, but also from driving more traffic back to, uh, back to the website to watch the videos. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type them into the chat box. Um, Dan, I, th I thought it was interesting the way that you talked about setting up essentially an in-house creative agency to serve these, um, uh, these uh, uh, custom publishing or co you know, content marketing on behalf of the advertiser. Um, in your diagram, the only bubble that was missing was like editorial or writers. Uh, you had video, you had uh, art, mm -hmm. uh, social media, and I'm blanking on the fourth one. But um, it, it, was that on purpose? Is, is there some separation that's been created in your uh, organization on that front? Uh, well, we don't uh, like our editors to write uh, a copy for our advertisers. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, at least not, certainly not to have the name on it. We've never done that. Actually, I do the writing. <laughs> uh, so maybe, the, and for the social media campaigns, we do have a person that writes the, you know, does the tweets and, and the, the Facebook ads and stuff like that. But maybe I didn't think of it because I'm the one who does it. <laughs> right. uh, and I do, we do the vast majority of our revenue uh, in the video department comes from me going out and selling video, and I say me because video is very hard to sell for someone who's not familiar with video. There's lots of you can't say, well, you know, how much is how much is it for this video? Every single video has so many different factors that it's difficult to price. So the sales reps, what they generally do is ask their customers, "Are you interested in video?" If the customer says yes, I go in uh, sometimes with the sales rep, sometimes uh, by myself. A lot of times the sales reps are a little possessive of their customers and they like to go in there with me. That's fine. And I brainstorm with them and I come up with a, an idea and I, I pitch it to the customer and I say, what do you think of this? It's been very, very successful and this year it's, it's actually really exploded and we're already doubled our revenue in three months from uh, what we did all of last year. So it's really going and a lot of it is new stuff. We're doing all kinds of animation videos. Uh, I have some fairly large advertisers that are now interested in doing augmented reality, which I didn't put in my presentation, but uh, we are now just getting into doing some augmented reality uh, products for some customers, which is really exciting. So it's, it's a hugely exciting time, and I, could, and I could talk all day about video, but we don't have time. <laughs> well, thank you for that, and thank you for sharing some of your um, your pricing structure because it's always interesting to hear, uh, you know, in real life situations that it's it's five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars to to create a, a B roll of ten seconds. Um, oftentimes, we don't have that point of comparison when mm -hmm. we're when we're discussing this in the industry. Uh, I was wondering, you know, my experience with video working in a uh, a consumer marketplace is that it's very easy to lose your shirt, and um, they're, they're, it's because of that customization. Um, and so, have you found a way of, of standardizing to some degree? I know you said you just you went in and you you, you obviously you talked to the customer to understand their needs, but um, have you been able to to create um, a slate of offerings that that are somewhat standardized? Well, I've been doing this. Uh, five years now for Newcom, and we have, so we've probably done 200 videos in that time for advertisers. So I have a lot of examples to show them, and I have a, uh, a price, I have a fairly, uh, I know exactly how much, it, how long it's going to take some, me to shoot something, so I know how much I charge for that. I know, I have a pretty good, I have to ballpark how long it's going to take to edit. So I'm, I'm pretty good at, at guesstimating how long it's going to take me to do a project and, and therefore setting up. And I also give myself, you know, some margin in there. But, you know, since day one when I 
talked with Joe Gliona, the owner of the company, about what we do, we don't want to make, we, I probably undercharge actually, uh, because we are there uh, also to back up and, and to uh, sort of uh, strengthen the relationship we have with our advertisers. And, and part of that is being able to offer our expertise uh, in areas and uh, so they get access to our markets. If, if we do a video for a company, we upload it and put it up on our site and don't charge them. Uh, that's a value add. Uh, and we also don't charge as much because they're giving us a lot of money in other areas. They're buying, they're going to our trade shows, they're buying print advertising, they're buying banner ads. So, you know, I give them a, you know, a sort of friends and family discount on the, on the video side. So, yeah, it's, that's probably the hardest thing about doing video is figuring out the pricing structure so you don't, you know, lose your shirt and, uh, you know, but so far so good. Okay. Well, thank you. Our final presentation uh, is a walkthrough of an integrated branded content campaign uh, that was done for Cottage Life. We have Sue Haas and Greg Trout to present that. Great, thank you. This is uh, Sue Haas. I'm the director of digital media at Blue Ant Media, and I um, do focus on Cottage Life. Just to be clear, I'm I'm not walking through one particular uh, integrated case sample, but also touching on video, an uh, important uh, hot topic today. And then I'm going to throw to my colleague, Greg Trout, who's our Director of Broadcast Solutions at Blue Ant, and he's going to walk through uh, his experiences with clients, uh, specifically in our branded uh, video integrations. So just uh, starting off, So why are Blue Ann and Cottage Life interested in video and getting uh, focusing on this in a serious way? Well, as we all know, and Dan talked about, video usage is soaring. This is a screen grab from eMarketer showing weekly time spent online among adults in Canada by device. This is from last year in 2015. So I'm just going to look at the top two bolded areas where we're seeing uh, weekly time spent on mobile. So for video in particular, that's 500 uh, minutes a week. That's 41% of all usage, and for desktop below we're seeing of 520 minutes spent online by adults, uh, 254 of those are video specific, so almost 48%, which to us at Blue Ann and Cottage Life is, is very significant in showing that uh, audience is moving there in, in a very big way. Of course, we're not just looking at industry insights, particularly for a brand like Cottage Life that's very niche and does few older than the general industry, we do have to look at our actual audience consumption and habits. And we are seeing our cottage life demographic embracing video and their habits are evolving. Our daily video consumption overall has increased by about 49 minutes uh, per day since 2010. Our Facebook video views have increased by 163% over the last year. And our YouTube page uh, is increasingly growing. Our subscriber base is just shy of 200,000 subscribers right now, and we have very high engagement on our video views. Just a note on YouTube uh, in particular, we did rebrand our main channel uh, last year to Cottage Life DIY. Cottage, we do think of Cottage Life as a very niche brand, but yet for YouTube it just wasn't niche enough. So posting videos across entertaining and food and how-to, we weren't getting the repeat uh, visits we were looking for and views, and we decided to focus in exclusively on our best performing video, which was our how-to DIY uh, around, mostly around one of our hit shows and, and um, talents called The Projects, and that has been uh, <coughs> extremely successful for us. Um, Cottage Life also focuses on video because we are a multi-platform brand. We have a national television channel, and that leads to cross-platform awareness and viewing of our video content in many formats. So our audience watches long-form TV episodes uh, on air. They can also uh, consume those on our website. They watch short-form webisodes on, online and on YouTube, as I mentioned. And we also post video uh, natively on Facebook and Instagram. And we also use Facebook in particular short 15-second video clips to drive back to full-length video uh, to consume on site. We also have in the past and will in the future have video available in our Rich Media Digital Edition. 
and we have been using augmented reality uh, through Blipper and Shazam in our print publication. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about something we just started a few months ago. It's very new, but we've launched four new original stands alone video series. They're called Cottage Q&A, The List, Who Knew, and Cottage Then. Cottage Then in particular is a series uh, about what we call slow TV. So you can watch a minute and a half of a crackling campfire or 50 seconds of someone slowly walking down the beach. Uh, and those have been uh, very popular for us. We have been testing those natively on Facebook, which has been successful so far. Um, this, we've launched these, as I already said, because our, our demo is moving into video and also uh, equally important, we have a very high client demand for pre-roll and for brand uh, integration into video, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Each of these new series, uh, we are trying to instigate a release schedule to build our loyal viewers. This has proved to be very uh, successful on YouTube, so posting the clips at the same day or time every week. They, we shoot most of them on location, but we also incorporate existing footage and, and still photography when possible obviously to uh, help with budgeting and just being able to produce more clips in a regular cadence. And the video primarily lives on site, but we do amplify it across all our own media, so across social media, across our TV channels, and in our print magazine. I'm going to uh, also mentioning just some uh, emerging trends that we're experimenting with video. So a few weeks ago, we posted a full-length episode uh, of our premiere of Colin and Justin. One of our hit shows, we posted the first episode in its entirety uh, natively on Facebook, so 22 minutes. Um, we really wanted to see how people, if they would watch a 22-minute TV episode on Facebook. Uh, in our opinion, the results were strong on that, and, and we will be experimenting more with that in the future. And in a couple of weeks, um, to coincide with our uh, hit series projects, we are launching 12 webisodes that are in 360 video and also virtual reality. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Greg, who is going to talk about uh, how we work with clients on integrating them into our video and uh, client interest overall from Blue Ants for our branded video. Thanks, Sue. So at, uh, at Blue Ants, and specifically within our media solutions group, what we do a lot of and what we've done a lot of over the last couple of years uh, is content marketing. And, and what we feel with, um, with content marketing uh, in our content marketing group is, is really that brands can be at the center of storytelling. And what we think needs to happen and what, what should continue to happen is that brands can be woven into the DNA of a story and help push that story along and create compelling content for audience. Uh, but what we, we also know uh, is that there is a large appetite right now out there for content marketing, uh, but it's very important that this content be created properly. The, the reality is when you're getting into the content marketing space and you're pushing this content out over various platforms, you're giving the audience and the consumer a very powerful voice to comment on and quite frankly approve uh, the content that, that they're consuming. So for, from a brand point of view, it's very important for them to do this properly. It's a lot different than say running a, a print ad or even a brand self-spot on television where the audience and the consumer doesn't really have a platform to comment and be vocal for the content they're consuming but with branded content they are. So what we do is we work with brands to make sure that this content is done properly uh, and executed the right way. And one of the biggest challenges uh, and the biggest ways that we do this is how much and how little the actual brand itself is integrated and exposed into the content. Viewers don't mind that content is brought to you by brands or powered by brands, but they don't want to feel tricked. They don't want to feel that they're be roped into watching a piece of content that is ultimately a commercial. So it's important to have a very subtle balance um, when we're doing that. Uh, the other uh, part of, of what we specifically do, and I know we talked about this at the beginning in, in terms of the, the campaigns uh, that we run and execute. At Blue Ant, um, there's really two types of campaigns and two types of content marketing campaigns that we work on. Uh, the, the first type is content and branded content that is on brand for Blue Ant. So if we look at Cottage Life as the example, uh, and then the, on this slide there's a, a logo for Timbermark. So it is creating branded content that is a very direct extension for one of our brands. And what we do there is we, we take a brand like Cottage Life or even a brand within Cottage Life, which can be a show 
or a story, and we extend that brand into a content series for a client. And we've had a lot of success uh, primarily with Cottage Life in this space, and quite frankly, every day are working with various brands and creating content around Cottage Life. Uh, the other aspect of that is creating content that does not align uh, whatsoever with the Blue Ant brand, and it's just a, create a straight content marketing play where we create the content and we push it out over um, various platforms to make sure the right people consume the content at the right time. And Affluent and within Media Solutions, we deal with each stage of the production and the execution of that content. So it starts with the brainstorm where we come up with an idea and a concept. We then put the pieces together uh, as far as the execution is concerned. So how are we going to shoot this? Where are we going to shoot it? Ultimately, what's the cost? And really, what's the story and how does the brand fit into that? And that's really the most important part of the process where we sit down with our creative director and whoever we're dealing with on the brand side uh, and we make sure there's the right balance there of the investment is worthwhile because it's exposure to the brand. There's not too much exposure that's going to turn the audience off. Uh, and then we, we, we're really off to the races, quite frankly, uh, in producing the content where we send crews um, to every corner of the world, uh, producing content for brands from uh, automotive to packaged goods and everything in between. And then we take care of everything on the back end, and that's really with our project management team where they make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. And also the content is, uh, is just at every other level that uh, the client is looking for. And then the last part of that is our performance. So if it isn't really aligning with the Blue Ant brand, we obviously need to make sure that the right people see this content, and we have a performance group that pushes this content out through a number of different platforms to make sure the right, the right uh, viewers are exposed to it. Uh, and like I said, we, we've been doing this uh, for a couple of years and we deal with all types of brands and our, our shooting content on any given week at any part of the world um, with various themes and, and strategies. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, please feel free, everyone listening, uh, to type in your questions in the chat box. Uh, specifically for Sue and Greg, but uh, we can open it up as well to general questions shortly thereafter. Uh, Sue, we have a question about um, it, how are you able to monetize on YouTube or if you are monetizing on YouTube? Could you uh, maybe expand on that a bit? Sure. Um, it's in a it has been the challenge, I will admit. We, yes, the answer is yes, we are monetizing on YouTube. So I should actually, let me step back there. As Greg said, we do on-brand um, work and we do off-brand work. Our on-brand uh, YouTube monetization has, uh, has been slower than maybe we would have thought because uh, you are splitting revenue with Google on YouTube. So uh, you're having to get... Uh, a lot more views than you would be on site for the same amount, the same CPM. Uh, but yes, we are we are selling ads on YouTube. I don't know if that's answering your question. And a lot of that, a lot of that, to Sue's point, a lot of that monetization though can come from the the like there's really two types of content for Cottage Life, for example, that we run on YouTube. One is is your basic Cottage Life content that we create for the channel and brand. The other is the content that we're creating around brands right. uh, and and clients. So that part of the monetization, like we would run, we would take content that we've created for brands and we would run that um, alongside the organ companion to uh, Cottage Life content that's right on YouTube. Yeah, sorry, to be clear, I was talking specifically about uh, pre-roll on YouTube where Greg's touching on integrated, uh, brands integrated into the actual videos, which is a whole other revenue stream on YouTube for us. All right, thank you. I do want to mention that today's webinar, both the audio and the presentation, will be available for download. And you can capture this information for reference or to share with your colleagues by going to magazinescanada.ca uh, slash advertising slash webinar series. And it's going to be up next week. Uh, we have a question from Zach. Welcome back, Zach. Uh, do you find that the pre-play ads deter users, or for the most part, they're willing to wait because the videos are so good. Uh, and I'll open that up to uh, all of you who have used video in your in your integrated campaigns. I can 
uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, I try and strongly suggest to our advertisers that uh, they keep their pre-play to 10 seconds. Uh, but if they insist on on going longer, I have a skip ad. I skip this ad after after 10 seconds, and there's a thing that pops up that says you can skip this ad in nine, eight, seven. So that that does help, uh, and uh, and it, it definitely the longer the preplay, the more people bail on the video. But it's still I think when I had the preplay that 10 seconds, I think it was still over 90% watched the preplay all the way through and and got into the video. It was like 90. I think it was like 93 or 94 percent, something like that. But you do get some drop off. We have a question from Jana. Do you create graphic only based video or do you send a videographer and team to interview or shoot on location? Uh, if the latter, do you travel to shoot on location and how many people are involved in creating a video? Uh, I'm not quite sure who that's directed toward, and I, I think b both uh, Dan and uh, Sue and Greg can speak to it. Um, sure, I can start off. So we do do both. Uh, if you go to um, cottagelife.com, you will see a lot of the gra a lot of the recent videos are graphic based with text overlay. Um, However, we, we also go to location um, for budgetary reasons, for our owned and operated video, not a client uh, integrated video. We tend to stay around southwestern Ontario on our shoots. Um, and we take on the shoots, there's a producer, a camera person, um, and generally if there's any cast that need to be in p talent in the video, obviously they are there. So probably about five people, and we try again, for our owned and operated video to do it, uh, you know, there and back in a day, but occasionally we do overnight shoots. For the branded video, as Greg talked about, uh, it, it can be much more elaborate. So as I had in the slide and he spoke about, we've flown to Peru, we've flown to Iceland, we've done much bigger shoots with a much bigger yeah, staff. And, and, and sometimes we, we piggyback on, on content that we're creating corporately. So if, if we're sending a team out for Cottage Life to shoot something for the channel, uh, sometimes we can piggyback on that and use that infrastructure really to shoot the similar content for a brand. We also do pretty much everything. We do graphic, we do green screen studio stuff, we do uh, editorial videos. Interesting, uh, we have two types of editorial videos. We do uh, one where we send a crew out, uh, and a lot of times it's to the truck manufacturers are launching a new truck. So they'll actually pay to fly us out there, much like they pay to fly reporters to a press event. They'll pay uh, and fly our video crew down there. And it started out with myself and a writer who would drive the truck, who is a journalist, but he also drove professionally for 20 years, so really knew his stuff. And we would get the truck for an in af a day after the press event. They would give it to us for an entire day. And uh, we went to town. We come back with 150 gig of video footage and uh, put together, uh, you know, usually three or four videos. But uh, what we've started to do is, uh, with the price of, the quality of uh, phone videos even uh, going up so high, we do what we call focus on videos. So if an editor is at a press event, they will actually record a bunch of, get a bunch of B-roll of the, of the press event or of the product that's being sold. They'll do some uh, stand up. Sometimes they'll hold the phone out and do a do a stand up, or they'll write some narration when they get back. And the idea with those is to for the editor to shoot it. He gives us all the material. Sometimes he'll even uh, send it via WeTransfer or, or Dropbox overnight. And we've had a video edited in four hours and up uh, on our website the next afternoon. Uh, so I like those a lot because you know then now you have five people out there shooting videos for you rather than the, the relying exclusively on the video department to do everything. In the time that we have remaining, uh, another question, how much emphasis do you put on the importance of direct research as a way of knowing the wants and needs of, of the audience ultimately when de de developing this kind of content? Uh, uh, Haley, when you were creating This is 40, Yes. Did that come from original consumer insights that you gained from, for instance, Vividata or other research that you may have done? 
You mean the survey itself? No, uh, no the, concept. The, the, the concept, the idea that you have this group of women and that uh, you want to delve in further into understanding the marketplace. Yeah, that was just an idea generated by our editorial team purely um, in an effort to re redefine ourselves and our audience in the digital space and beyond. Okay. Yeah. So Dan, when you're when you're creating um, uh, video content for an advertiser, uh, are you relying on your in-house knowledge of that marketplace and any research that you have in order to uh, bring that to the fore? Uh, in the trucking industry. I've been doing videos on, on, the, on, the truck, on the trucking industry for nine years and interviewed hundreds of people, so I have a fairly extensive knowledge of the trucking industry, so I can usually come up with stuff on my own. When it comes to dental, not so much. Uh, so I rely on the, uh, the team in the oral health group, the editorial department, or really spending time with the customer learning uh, what what is the message they're trying to get across. I, I really spend a lot of time figuring out uh, what their objectives are and who their target audience is. Uh, and then I just, you know, ideas just pop into my head and uh, I, I pitch it and hopefully they like it and usually they do. Okay, thank you. It's, it's really impressive the, the level of expertise that our panelists have brought to the discussion and, and to the, the work that they do. Um, Here's a question. Uh, you know, someone in the audience perhaps doesn't have uh, the capacity, the ability to bring on someone with uh, the depth of experience you have, Dan, for instance, in, in broadcast and video, um, or to have a Blue Ant Media as their, uh, you know, parent company who can, uh, who specializes in the creation of this kind of content. So, what would you recommend to um, a, a publication that perhaps? does not right now have a video um, program or a video capacity, uh, what would be, uh, first of all, do you think it would be important for them to explore and develop this? And secondly, what would be the first steps that you would recommend for them? I'll open that up to the panel. It's, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I actually have hired uh, some interns from that have just graduated from film school. And because these young artists have been doing editing since some cases elementary school, uh, unlike me, I started on a three quarter inch and I actually, when I went to film school, I, I was cutting on a steam deck, which is a flatbed for, with actual film. Uh, but, uh, but there's a lot you can do and I think, but, the, but you really need someone who can guide, someone that young, you'd really need someone to, to guide them, it, it is it is tricky, uh, but it's also if you want to, like Newcom made a significant investment in me five years ago, and you know lost money for a few years until it took time to 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 establish and and and, and take root and develop the relationships with the customers. But it it, it is a big chicken and egg, difficult question. Uh, I have to let's do another uh, WebEx on that. That's, that's a whole topic in and of itself, I think. I don't know, Greg, if you agree. Uh, Sue, I'll just chime in. I, I mean, I do agree. I actually came um, over for, with Cottage Life before we uh, merged with Blue Ant. We were a much smaller business, obviously not tied to a TV uh, company, and it was very challenging to create video. We did do it. The the staff uh, put it together, but your budget is a, uh, a lot smaller. You don't have the editing suites and the resources and the camera people or the camera equipment, for that matter, to pull off the quality uh, or the level of professionalism of the videos. So I would say um, to try to experiment with it as best you can. Obviously, your volume is going to be less. Um, maybe a lot shorter clips that you could share on social media to start um, or having you know one clip to coincide with with your magazine releases if you're a magazine company but um, starting slowly and and yeah maybe possibly to what Dan was saying bringing in people that have had experience grow, um, through their schooling where they can do what we call predators so you're a producer and an editor in one role uh, as opposed to having to have multiple people that can do very specialized skills. That's what we have. I have, uh, I just hired an intern because we're so busy, but I have two full-time videographers that are also editors. So they're uh, 
you know, they're they're one man crews. They can go out and shoot and do the audio and do the editing and uh, and do everything. And I think that's important, especially when you're just starting out. I want that as my new job title, Predator. Yeah, it's a great uh, on that note, and we're running out of time, unfortunately, and I'd like to offer our thanks to Haley, Dan, Sue, and Greg for so graciously offering their time and expert insights into this creative world of integrated content development. Um, a quick plug for the next Magazines Canada event, which is uh, State of the Magazine Nation, and registration is now open. This is for uh, a Toronto event on April the 28th as well. We've just opened registration for Magnet. Uh, this year's conference is taking place June 7th to 9th at the Courtyard Marriott, downtown Toronto. Uh, there's a ton of great ad sales sections this year, including three sessions from sales guru Ryan Dorn. Uh, topics covered include pro pro excuse me, programmatic advertising, sponsored content, digital sales strategies, uh, and more. And uh, register now at Magnet 2016.ca. Thank you everyone for participating in this session. Uh, I, as I mentioned, it will be available next week uh, for download on the site, magazinescanada.ca. And a big thanks to our sponsor, Ontario Media Development Corporation, for making these kinds of professional development sessions possible. Thank you everyone. <laughs>